There's a faction of Ugandan society whose reaction is angry and violent, who can't stand being silent. But then there's another perspective. See, what does it take to govern effectively? One school of thought would say the rule of law. But not all Ugandans feel like that, given what the country's gone through before. Tribal persecution and gruesome war. Well, Seveni came to power in the 80s, and as of 2018, 80% of Ugandans were under 35. Yeah, you heard me right, 35. They've never experienced another leader, and whoever that could be can't actually prove they've got the requisite experience to govern either. In fact, the other day Museveni gave a speech and the way he addressed the country was particularly candid. Bazukulu, literally, grandkids. Bear in mind, Bobby Wine's 36. He hasn't really had to win popularity with a propaganda machine or using dirty tricks. He's self-made and he's well-paid. To many ghetto kids, that's a heavenly mix. These times, come the next election, Museveni, 76. <laughs> but there is something granddad like about him. That's why so many can't imagine life without him. He represents the familiar, hence the parallels with tensions in Libya. First of all, the leadership of both Gaddafi and Museveni benefited their countries heavily. People often talk about both individuals' ability to move with political agility. Their man that brought stability and they brought the notion of government. Plausibility. But their countries were divided. More than they could take, a lot of young people decided. People were tired of poverty when politicians were commonly buying expensive shit. People were tired of censorship. These times, Kampala has seen a steep rise in street crimes and in Benghazi. Race riots eventually hit. And even then, Libya's unemployment rate was way better. Uganda's GDP per capita, seven years later, is way deader. What I'm saying is it's, it's not like people ain't fed up. If only corruption meant you could bribe someone so that change sped up. And corruption is another one. In fact, it's probably problem number one. Guys don't mind paying bribes and kickbacks if the give back is proportionate. But if they're paying into a system that doesn't benefit them, it's unrewarding. It's extortionate. Now with high rates of adult literacy and more exposure because of globalization, people start noticing what they don't have in an underdeveloped and overpriced nation. That's how you get a brain drain. You can't maintain growth when talent finds it hard to prevail. People get frustrated and end up taking their skill sets to a different part of the world. Now Libya experienced something similar. Guys would rather graft in a land that's unfamiliar than stay there in a state that doesn't play fair. So you got people feeling cheated by the system, non-violent resistors being given time in prison, tensions over tribalism, talent walking out. I've forgotten which country I'm talking about. Maybe not with politics, but music? Even Museveni knows the power of music. Yeah? Yeah, come on. Music's a great way of making us think. Look, it's given us so many ways of making a drink. We got the juice, innit? Come on. <laughs> and we won't stop producing it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, Cuzzy? Yeah. All over the world. Say this all the time, Cuzzy. We got the Brother, juice. all over the world is the most common beverage. Yeah, that's real talk. And that's given us a lot of leverage. A lot of privilege, a lot of heritage. But all of this comes from the streets. Yet we still can't save our daughters and sons from the streets. We got famous artists walking with guns on the streets and food still runs the alternate funds on the streets. We want our music to be our savior from all of this self-destructive behavior. But it's just a soundtrack to what's really happening. All the issues that we're not really tackling.
Now, Uganda's presidential election this week has been marred by serious violence and allegations of vote rigging. The country's president, who's been in power for 35 years, has a clear lead early official preliminary results show. The man challenging him, musician turned politician Bobby Wine, said he'd unearthed evidence of the worst vote rigging in Ugandan electoral history. George the Poet, who's of British Ugandan heritage, has released a thought piece, Black, Yellow, Red, named after the colour of Uganda's flag, about the country's politics and future. When we talk about the hood, we're talking deprivation, but we need to learn to describe it properly. In London, there's all sorts of desperation, but Ugandan poverty is a different kind of poverty. It's the kind where you might not live inside the property, it's the kind where you live by the midnight economy. People don't make it out of this life that common. So Bobby Wine was a slight anomaly. He used his voice and made music with it. Back when people thought there was no future in it, he represented the poor through his lyrics and the youth gravitated to his spirit. Bearing in mind, I couldn't speak Luganda, so more time I'm singing along to the odd English phrase. But one thing I remember clear as day is how my cousins and their friends used to sing his praise. Well, George, the poet, is on the line now. Good afternoon, George. Good afternoon, Cathy. Thanks so much for joining me. Really enjoyed your film. Very thought-provoking. It was filmed in, in London and Uganda pre-lockdown, as I understand it, mostly. That's Just right. take us through what inspired you to do it, first of all. Uh, in late 2018, I um, turned on to the um, abuses of power levelled against uh, Bobby Wine. Um, and I wrote quite passionately about that on my podcast. Have you heard George's podcast? Um, and months after writing that, I flew out to Uganda in uh, early 2019, January, uh, and, and just recorded a lot of that material uh, in situation in the community that Bobby Wang grew up in. I felt like it was very important to give an artistic um, representation of what was going on. And it is, so it's been a long time in gestation. I was fascinated by your message, uh, politics won't save us. And this role reversal, as you describe it, because you've put mm. your ambition to be an MP on hold, I'll come back to that. But in a sense, you've swapped politics for music. President Museveni's challenger singer, Bobby Wine, has done the reverse. Just tell us why you've sort of lost faith in politics. Well, the feeling in Uganda is not different from the feeling in the UK, the feeling in the US, that the political space is divisive, often um, presenting voters with binary choices that are a reduced version of what they feel that they um, can believe in and stand by. Uh, in the case of Bobby Wine, his power initially came from his music and he traded that power in arguably for... Um, currency in a space that is entirely corrupt, is entirely controlled and rigged against him. And now we are all distraught at the um, continued injustices against him and his supporters. Uh, and, and that seems like a missed opportunity to me because he did have um, followers and people that hung on his every word. And he had a, a basically a place in Ugandan society and the Ugandan economy as an artist that would enable him to really enact more change than I have ever seen a Ugandan politician execute. But when, but when everything is stacked against him, he, he had little hope, didn't he? Had li li little hope in what sense? Well, just little hope of, of prevailing, of winning, you know, winning the election and winning it. Because everything that, you know, the state apparatus, the yeah. corruption, it's all stacked against him, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I think there are a, a, there's a range of wins available. And I don't think it's will he will the election be fair or not? That that is the only determinant of success here. I think what he has successfully demonstrated is that you can speak truth to power. It's that you can demonstrate the numbers of people that are truly frustrated. You can give voice to a generation who feel um, that they are being uh, short, short, short changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the polls have closed um, and obviously there are these very official results showing that President Museveni gets yet more years in power. Uh, do What do you fear might ensue now in terms of violence on the streets and so on? Well, it frustrates me that there are so many young people invested in a political system that is rigged against a transfer of power, that is rigged against participation by the masses, because what happens is 
when that realization dawns on these young people, people get really upset. So I'm I'm concerned then, about the uprising uh, afterwards and how that will be violently suppressed without mm, without punishment. After the, mm-hmm. And after the sorry sorry the, the the line's a little bit crackly sorry there's a bit of a delay as well sorry about that um because after what happened in 2011 uh, Uganda's contested election then triggered a week of of really deadly street protests didn't it so you worried that the same might you know history might repeat itself in that. Yeah, and again, I think it all comes down to misplaced expectations in the political system. We want development. We want opportunity for the talent all 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 across Uganda and the continent. And in uh, 60 years of independence, this has never been delivered to the masses. So why do we continue to try and transform Uganda's fortunes in the same arena? I strongly believe mm. the creative spaces, um, enterprise, not just creativity, agribusiness, um, and, and unfortunately, it does come back to politics to an extent because access to opportunities in, the, in these spaces are often dictated by politicians. But the reality is um, that is our most likely non-violent route towards emancipation. So you're placing your faith in music, but a lot of people might be really sad to hear that because you said you wanted to be an MP. Will you return to those political ambitions someday, do you think? I'll return on the right terms. And right now the terms are unacceptable. The terms are that you have to be part of a major party that may or may not represent everything you believe in. That's just unacceptable to me because I believe in everything I believe in. So Prime Minister George the Poet is still a possibility if electoral reform <laughs> happens. Please tell me. <laughs> I didn't say that, you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, can you see yourself in number 10, changing, making huge changes to the country? I can see the country changing enough that that is not as outlandish as it currently sounds to me. It's good to hear that. And I, I was fascinated by the, the kind of parallels you drew in the film and here, you know, what's going on, uh, you know, in the US and the, the common themes there about disillusionment in politics. Interesting that the Ugandan officials said that chaos surrounding the US elections has deprived Washington of moral authority. Interesting point, isn't it? It is an interesting point, but I think when you look more broadly across history, what has happened is that there was the move from, I think, representative democracy to participatory democracy. And what we have now is a lot of change in a short space of time. Now everyone is a broadcaster thanks to social media. Now we have ability to communicate and organize that generations before us unfortunately didn't have. And I think, I think it's actually taken us a while, Kathy, to wrap our heads around that, to realize that all the, the role that politics once played that we often take for granted because of the cultural practices that we inherit, voting and democracy participation, that role, um, can 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 transfer to the people more reliably now because we have ways of communicating, verifying information and speaking and acting in real time that kind of nullifies a lot of our frustrations with politics. 